And welcome, Hoosier fans, to a huge victorious episode of the Assembly Call. Tonight we rewatched, actually, we just watched our Hoosiers 32 0. Indiana Hoosiers defeat the Michigan Wolverines 86-68 to to complete the first undefeated season since UCLA in 1973 and to win the third national championship for your Indiana Hoosiers. After trailing by six at halftime, the Hoosiers scored 57 points on its way to this victory. Solid contributions from a couple of bench players who were forced into action with the injury to Bobby Wilkerson were somewhat of the key to victory, as well as some of the stellar play from the starters. Uh, And this is Indiana's third national championship, and I don't think Indiana fans will ever get tired of hanging banners. I'm your host, Brian Tonsoni, here with Ryan Phillips and Chris Williams, and we're going to break down this historic victory for you on this edition of the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. And let's start this show the way we start every show, and that is with our banner moment. And Indiana is the national champion. When it comes down, Indiana will be champion. Smart takes the shot. The Hoosiers have won the national championship. The banner moment for me occurred uh, at the two-minute mark. Um... When Bobby Wilkerson went down with uh, an injury, he had an elbow to the back of his head, and it took a long time for him to even get off of the floor and back into the locker room and ended up with a concussion. Uh, the banner moment is the contributions of the, the subs off the bench who came in and it started off with Jim Cruz uh, and then uh, Jimmy Wisman, uh, Radford, or not Radford, yeah, Radford was the first sub in, then Jimmy Cruz, and I thought that, get, that was really well managed. Uh, when you lose someone who is as strong uh, as Bobby Wilkerson defensively, and he could add some things offensively, and just the blow to the psyche of the team, who's a year before lost Scott May to a broken uh, hand and lost an undefeated season in the tournament, uh, that was the moment where this season could have gone off the rails. Uh, but somehow, and especially at halftime, after halftime, your Indiana Hoosiers were able uh, to right the ship uh, and secure their third national championship. The other banner moment is seeing Quinn Buckner dance and hug Scott May on the sidelines in the last uh, th- three or four seconds of the game. Nothing is uh, better to see your Indiana Hoosiers celebrate after working really hard two years in a row and being the best team in college basketball for two um, years in a row. So I, I got I got to add one there, Coach. It was yeah. uh, watching Quinn Buckner try and catch and hold Scott May when he jumped into his arms. That yeah, he, and just and just just slowly hearing his back collapse as he could because <laughs> he couldn't hold him, but he held him. But it was it was a dicey proposition for a second and, there, and not caring one bit uh, about any injuries from the celebration. So tonight our banner moment is brought to you uh, by some company named Homefield Apparel. Now look, you may not have ever heard of Homefield Apparel. And that's fine. We're sitting here in 1976, and Homefield apparently isn't even going to be founded for another 42 years. You see, a guy by the name of Hitchcock reached out to me earlier this week and told me about a premonition he had that involved his future grandson founding an online apparel company, whatever that is. And I was like, okay, sure, you're a crazy old man. But he paid me a quarter and two nickels to run an ad, so I said, okay. This old guy was talking about all kinds of crazy stuff, like the Cubs and Red Sox and White Sox all winning the World Series, the New England Patriots becoming the greatest NFL dynasty of all time, and O.J. Simpson being accused of murder. I mean, just truly insane stuff that had no reasonable chance of happening. But the apparel thing sounded interesting. He claimed his grandson would graduate from IU and then found a company that would have the most comfortable T-shirts and hoodies available anywhere and that they're going to have old IU logos that haven't even been seen for decades. For example, apparently they're going to bring the bison back, uh, which Indiana hasn't used in seven years after discontinuing it in 1969. Uh, Anyway, apparently it will be incredible. And he had some more gibberish that he wanted me to tell you, and he said it was very important for me to be precise and for you to write this down. Go to homefieldapparel.com. Whatever that is, homefieldapparel.com. Use something called a promo code uh, assembly20 to get uh, 20% off of this future product. 
Uh, none of this makes any sense here in 1976, but we really don't care. Uh, we just won a national championship. Uh, we didn't. We watched our Indiana Hoosiers win a national championship, but hopefully it will at some point. Okay. Uh, at, now it's time to uh, move the ball, find an open man, and get some opening thoughts from the rest of our team. Joining us, uh, known as IU Artifacts, Chris Williams, your thoughts on the 1976 championship uh, victorious Indiana Hoosiers. It was quite a game. Um, early on, it seemed that the Hoosiers were kind of uh, in a funk dealing with a more up-tempo uh, style that Michigan was trying to play, that run and gun that Johnny Orr has done all season. And uh, it was sloppy at times, and, and obviously Wilkerson – going out early was uh was going to be a problem because he's you know he's not the perennial scorer for IU but he's definitely their their biggest defensive uh you know uh weapon and it would have been interesting to see what he would have done on Ricky Green the rest of the uh, game but Indiana came in um at starting the second half down and really kind of settled in uh, the shots were starting to fall Benson and, and May really started to to take it to uh uh, the Michigan defenders, and I think the key thing was when um, when Phil Hubbard, when Phil Hubbard, uh, the freshman sensation for Michigan, went out. It, it was kind of uh, the beginning of the end for Michigan's chances because they really didn't have anybody to stop uh, any kind of interior uh, play from either May, who was really around the basket a lot of the game, and on the baseline, and also Benson. So, uh, just it, it, you know, a great feeling that you know last year's team that should have gone undefeated. Couldn't quite get it, uh, losing to Kentucky in that uh, regional semifinal, but or regional final, excuse me. But it's it's a great feeling to see this squad uh, achieve 32-0 and only be the seventh team ever to do it. And and Ryan, your thoughts of watching uh, the 1976 team pull off this victory this evening? Uh, what what struck me was just the veteran leadership and and the performances you got from veterans in this. Scott May, 26 points. Kemp Benson, a junior, 25 points. Quinn Buckner, the consummate, you know, point guard, pure point <laughs> guard for Indiana, 16 points. Abernathy, 11 points. It, and then, you know, you had Cruz come off the bench and fill in a bit when, when Wilkerson went out. You just had good performances by the veterans, and they stayed steady throughout. They never got up. They never got down. They just kept doing what they did, and that was pounding the paint and just going after it, getting the ball to Benson, getting it to May, 10 feet and in, just going to work. And then and then Buckner, you know, getting to the line, and though he's not a good free throw shooter, wound up hitting six of nine free throws uh, and, and finishing the game off there. Uh, and also, you know, getting inside and making some things happen. Abernathy stepping up and making some buckets, too. I, I think that you you rely on your stars, but you also rely on your veterans in big games. And and it just so happens in Indiana, stars are their veterans. And and they leaned on those guys. And when Michigan got a, a bit of a lead going in the first half, they didn't get too up, too, too down. They just kept doing what they were doing, pounded inside, get those guys the ball. And it wound up paying off. And they were steady throughout where I thought that Michigan was just up and down, up and down, up and down. And that happens sometimes when you run an up-tempo offense. You run into to down cycles where you just kind of hit a rut. And Indiana went on a big run in the second half to really put the put the game in the, in the rearview mirror. And um, I, I just thought that that's – what the takeaway was is, is you get your two all Americans and you just pound the ball with them. You get your point guard, make sure he's distributing the ball, getting it to the right guys and then finishing at the hoop. And also, you know, Buckner had five steals as well. He was, he was a pest defensively. And then you had those other guys, you know, the other veterans step up when uh, Wilkerson went out. So I, I, that was my takeaway. It was just veteran leadership from your stars. Let's talk a little bit about Wilkerson leaving. Um, it's just between the two and the three minute mark. And, and he's such a athletic uh, player, jump center uh, every game. To, uh, well, to tell you how athletic he is, and, and just a great defender. And, and how Ryan, do you feel that? In how did they manage to cope uh, with such an injury early in the game, where you had to make adjustments offensively and defensively? Well, defensively, they struggled containing Ricky Green. I mean, he was up and down the floor a lot, and he finished with 18 points, but he had a plenty of opportunities at the rim that he did not finish. And I think that it was they relied on their size on the interior to really harass when Michigan was trying to get inside. Uh, but really, they mixed it up. They had different guys sort of throwing looks at him. You had Buckner on him a little bit. You had, uh, you know, they threw Cruz and Wisman at him and and they just they they gave different looks. I don't think they ever fully contained him, but I think that they were able to kind of slow him down a little and make it a little more difficult for him to get up and down the floor. Um but 
he still got loose. And the key was just making sure that when he went to the rim, he had a tough time with it. And and you saw Benson and May in there all night, just kind of keeping him from having a clean look at the basket. Really, that was the key because you weren't going to, you weren't, you didn't have a replacement defender for, for Wilkerson. Um, so they, you know, just try to do, make do with what they could. And then what they did on the other end was just kind of wore Michigan down. I mean, they just wore them down. It was clear what was happening. They just ground them down, ground them down, ground them down. And that's how you make up for maybe not having your best defender is go down on offense and make those guys work on defense. That's going to slow the offense down. And that's what happened, especially late. This- I-, I thought uh, Indiana struggled um guarding uh, the perimeters they were running that little um high post where you i call it a scissors cut off the off the high post and and michigan was throwing the ball over the top to the guards early on and i think that was a problem you know you, you not only is wilkerson your best defender but it makes everyone else better defenders as well and you have someone like that and i thought it took most of the first half for indiana to adjust to what michigan was doing defensively without wilkerson Chris, uh, your, your thoughts, they, they put lots of players. It was started with Radford, then Cruz, and then ended up with Wisman. And it was interesting to watch Coach Knight deal with that. It wasn't a bunch of in and out trying to put a lot of subs in. It was one guy at a time, and almost that guy never got back in. Um, your thoughts on, on which one of those really uh, settled Indiana down the most and, and was key to the victory? I think it was very indicative that Wisman started the second half, um, you know, because I, I would have thought that Radford, who's a little bit bigger, would have been a, a little bit more of a the key to come in to kind of replace Wilkerson. But I, I think Wisman really, you know, if you look at his stat line, he plays 21 minutes and he has six assists, only one turnover. I think in a lot of ways he kind of settled things down. It was interesting to start the second half, he kind of commanded things and, and Buckner was playing more off the ball, which was interesting because Buckner is not the key scorer that, that, you know, he's not the guy you think of that's going to be someone who can come in and, and score 20 points like, like May. He has the ability to drive the basket, but like Ryan uh, said earlier, his free throw shooting is very iffy at times. So I, I think, um, you know, Wisman came in and really had a lot of good minutes. I thought uh, Rich Valavicious came in and had a lot of good, and, and his four minutes were, you know, he came in and scored a basket right away. Um, Cruz, the senior veteran, um, he came in and, and played really well. But I think Wisman was the key in a lot of ways because I think with, with Wilkerson in, you know, the games, it's not going to be as close as it is, especially going into, you know, the first, you know, 30 minutes of the game after 10, you know, once they got to about the 10-minute mark, things were beginning to turn because Michigan was beginning to tire. If you look at their – at their play, you know, nobody on their bench played more than 10 minutes the entire game. So their starters were really stretched to the limit. And then when, you know, you, like I said before, you get a guy like Phil Hubbard who, who's out, you know, with a lot of time left in the game and he's their big man, and, you know, their main score down low, it really changes the whole way that they have to a, a, approach it. And uh, it would have been interesting to see if, if Wilkerson would have been able to shut down Ricky Green more, as, as kind of been already said by Ryan. You know, you bring up an interesting point. I was probably going to save it for the second segment and things you might have missed is moving Buckner off of the ball. Uh, he was a little shaky at the beginning. There was a time when they went to the 3-2 zone and he totally missed, I think, May on the wing. And he, he had a couple just sloppy passes. Seemed like he was really rattled by the Wilkerson stuff maybe. And that was that's not the Buckner that uh, we saw most of the season, even though he, he did have a, a tough stretch in the middle of the season. But he became a screener. Uh, and he was the one of the screening for Benson, screening for, for May, and, and they put the ball both in Cruz's hand and later in Wisman's hand. I think that um, in some way did allow Indiana to get the ball because Buckner does a lot of good things. And if he isn't passing well, then he's going to go set a screen with that body, and I think that's that was a great thing. Ryan, I, I want to ask you about this. I think Indiana initially did not apply enough ball pressure in the first half was playing off the ball a little bit to clog things up, and that allowed Michigan's guards to find those over-the-top cutters and and find uh, the players in in a scoring and shooting position. And I think the difference in the second half was they came out a little bit further and played a lot of ball pressure. Uh, Your thoughts on Indiana's defense first half versus second half in tonight's ballgame? I I completely agree with you. There was no harassing passing lanes in the first, specifically the first five minutes. It looked like Michigan was able to get comfortable by, you're right, going over the top because Benson and May were were sort of 
occupied with their men, and then you'd have a guard slip in behind and go over the top. So that happened on several occasions. The Michigan was able to spread out a little bit and find some lanes to get to the hoop. And in the second half, you saw them pressure a little bit more on the ball. And now it wasn't it wasn't intense man to man pressure, but it was getting up and making Michigan move. You saw a lot of five second violations in this game on a couple on Indiana, and and the way that Michigan was guarding the ball forced them to do that. Indiana didn't do that; they didn't get right up on guys, but they did pressure the ball a little bit more, forced Michigan to keep the ball moving as opposed to standing and waiting for a cutter to maybe arrive. They had to sort of make the offense do something instead of just waiting for one play and one, one big cut. And so I thought that that was a smart move to do that. I think that started when, uh, uh, you know, after Wilkerson was out, it took them a few minutes to adjust and they, they, they finally started to move a little bit out, but then it was second half. They moved out and, and started defending a lot better and making Michigan work. And I also think that they, they sort of took the approach with green that if he was going to get by that first line of defense, they were going to funnel him into the middle where he was going to be going up against two big guys. And, as opposed to, you know, maybe spreading the defense out a little bit and letting giving him lanes all the way to the hoop. They just kind of sort of, all right, we're going to pressure you, make you go by us. And if you go by us, you got to run into these two big guys that are going to be standing waiting for you. And I think that made life a little more difficult for him, especially because he's a young guy and, and he's not, you know, a veteran who knows that, okay, let me pull up from five feet out and 10 feet out instead of going all the way into the rim. And then the last thing of the main storyline that I'd like to discuss here in, in first segment is tempo. Uh, it's been brought up already, and Chris, we'll, we'll come to you. Uh, it looked like Michigan, when it was at its best, was going up and down, but they weren't able to maintain that. And I'll, I would really say maybe, and see if you guys agree or not with this, that Indiana's offensive tempo in the second half – was faster. It was controlled. It was within the offense. It wasn't a fast break, but it was one pass shot or or they were really getting into their actions early and able to get good shots and score 57 points in the second half. So the thoughts on the tempo, the pace of the game tonight. I think a lot of the missed shots early uh, and the lack of rebounding by Indiana hurt their ability to defend and transition and get those easy putbacks because Michigan you know, once Ricky Green gets the ball and he's going, it's hard to stop him. One thing, you know, I, and another thing you could discuss with this along with with Wilkerson is we missed his rebounding. Uh, Wilkerson had 19 rebounds in the semifinal against UCLA, and him not being in there to, to attack the glass, it was something that was going to allow Michigan to get out and transition and really be destructive the way they can be. But I, I do think that um, – you saw Indiana try to be more methodical with the half court, let the motion offense run its course in the first half. And like you said, coach, um, they were willing to to kind of just run it down the throats of Michigan. I think part of that was due to the fact that uh, perhaps coach Knight knew that Michigan was going to get tired. Uh, you know, they tried, Michigan was, was trying to toward the end of the first half, trying to run the full court press and did it pretty effectively on a couple. They were able to get a couple uh, costly turnovers against Indiana, but I, you know, they tried in the second half and Indiana was able to break it relatively easy on, on a couple of occasions. But to me, um, seeing what Indiana was trying to do uh, in the second half by just trying to wear down Michigan and get them to start fouling more and, and kind of tugging more than moving their feet. You could see that when, you know, when they lost, uh, you know, to their starters, uh, you know, with foul trouble. And then that, that kind of changed the whole outcome of the game toward the end when it was kind of a you know, Indiana had control of it from that point on, and it was just kind of wearing, you know, running down the clock. A lot of times people think pace is only running up and down the floor, but it is your cuts, and it is how many times you get bumped and, and screened, and that can really wear people down. I agree. There was one time in the second half where Buckner comes down. I don't think he has the ball, but he throws both hands up in the air, and I think Kurt Gowdy said they're going to run some play, but it was a wing pass and a quick entry into the post where Benson scored, but they called it off for a foul on the ground. I think he missed a free throw. But that was what what I was seeing in pace was, hey, we're going to get that, you know, um, you know, we're going to get that ball quickly inside. So, um, you know, I think that's that was. It wasn't a mystery what they were trying to do. I mean, they just they were getting it inside to those two to to May and Benson or both, and and just making it work. I mean, it was not it was not a mystery what they were going to do. And who? So someone have the I know the numbers se- segment is next, but who is the um, 
there were eight turnovers for IU, which did lead to some breakouts uh, for Michigan, especially uh, against the press, as Chris said, too, is part of your your transition defense and stopping a tempo team is not giving them chances to run, is scoring and not turning the ball over. And, boy, Indiana shot better and, and took care of the ball a lot better in that second half. Um, Indiana, I just think- Indiana wound up with 13 turnovers. Michigan had 19. Yeah. Um, so I, I thought that I, I think a lot of those from Michigan came late. They were forcing a lot late. Once Indiana started getting them tired and started sort of you sort of saw that the every brick they you know every brick Indiana would lay in the wall of the victory. It just made that it made you know Michigan try harder and harder and harder and just started giving the ball away. But uh, they had three turnovers for May Benson Buckner and Abernathy, and then one to Wisman. That was they also had that stretch in the first, in the beginning of the second half where they had no turnovers, like in the first four and a half stretch. minutes, five yeah. minutes. Yeah, that was big. It goes to that old adage: the first five minutes really matter. You know, down six, hadn't played well, lost uh, one of your starters, uh, and then things come up. So, coming up uh, we, as we continue to break down uh, Indiana's victory over Michigan, I will point out the meaningful moment you might have missed. Uh, we'll go inside the numbers to highlight the most important stats from tonight. Uh, You're listening to the Assembly Call. Stick with us. What's up, y'all? It's Devontae Green, giving you the green light to watch Assembly Call after every IU game. Just don't listen to their opinions about shot selection. Remember, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Go Hoosiers. You're listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. I'm the coach, Brian Tonsoni, here with Ryan Phillips and Chris Williams. And we're talking about tonight's Indiana National Championship game victory over Michigan. It's now time for a meaningful moment uh, that you might have missed. I think there's a lot of them. And, yes, Devontae, uh, it's a shooter's game, buddy. You know, um, thanks for uh, bringing us into segment two. I'm going to point out, and I without the clock, and we'll talk about that in the in the last session when we're not totally about the game. Without the clock permanently on the television, it's kind of hard to take notes and write down exactly when uh, some of these things happen. But but one of the things that I want to point out that I thought was meaningful was Scott May's passing ability. Uh, obviously, he can score, and boy, that baseline jumper is just something that uh, I will play over and over and over again. Just silky smooth but let's talk a little bit about Scott May his total game and I there was a play where he was double teamed and Michigan early was coming out on the wing and double teaming him and he passed kind of over his head I, I think it was Benson at the free throw line hit a jumper or something but he knew where the offensive teammate was and he got rid of it really quick and uh th- that was a nice basket for Indiana um I think they were down, or it made that that play made it nineteen eighteen for IU in the first half, and and the first half was a struggle for IU, but he, he made a play there. So, um, you know, Ryan, talk about uh, May's versatility in, in just not scoring. I mean, maybe one of the you know best all around players in IU history. I mean, certainly certainly in there and. You you look at what he could do on different levels of the floor. You look at what he could do defensively. I mean, he's not he's not your best defender. That was Wilkerson, but he's a guy who is strong defensively. He's intimidating defensively. Guys don't want to go at that guy. Uh, and you look at his ability to hit a jumper. You look at his ability to be strong inside. You look at his ability to grab rebounds. I mean, how many emphatic rebounds did he and Kent Benson all? Uh, you know how how did they did they grab all game? Um, and then you know he grabbed two steals. He was he 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 was able to manage his foul trouble. He he did wound up with four in the game, but it never felt like he was really you know in danger. Um, I I think that it was just a great all around game. He didn't score thirty five points. He did, but he he scored twenty six, and he and he contributed to the team on every level made all six of his free throws. I mean, he's just so balanced and he does everything so well. He plays, you know, bigger than his size. And then he also is, has the ability to step out on the perimeter and pass the ball around, handle the ball, do everything you need to do. There's nothing that guy can't do on a basketball court. And that showed tonight, nobody could stop it. And, and, you know, 10 out of 17, he shot 58% from the field. Uh, I, I just think that, and he played 39 minutes. And that's the other thing is that, you know, with Wilkerson out, 
those other starters had to take on a huge burden to step up and, and kind of fill that role amongst them. And then with whoever was coming, who was, you know, in with them off the bench. So I just, he's just so good all around. And that was just such a vintage performance. And, and you know, it had to be huge for him to, to be there and win that championship because of what happened last year when, you know, they could, they couldn't win the national championship because they didn't have him. And, and it was, um, you know, at a hundred percent. And, and I, I don't know, I just think it's one of those things where it, it was such a moment of redemption for him and he didn't need the redemption to be an all time great, but, but being able to, to hoist that trophy, just put him into another stratosphere as an IU player. Chris, uh, there were many times when he would cut baseline, either come off a screen or he would flare to the baseline, uh, depending on where the defense was and get those open jumpers. But there were several times in the second half where he just created something over someone because the spacing was so tight. And we'll talk about that in the third segment about what hasn't aged well um, without the three-point line. But he, he was really incredible body control in getting up and getting his shot off. Uh, and he had that incredible acrobatic uh, offensive rebound. But talk about May's ability to score in a variety of ways. Well, you know, he has the, he has the shooting ability, but I think the one thing that, you know, you look at a lot of his baskets, he is, he around the rim, um, he just does things and like, you know, adding on to what Ryan says, you know, he's, he plays so much bigger than his size. He can play the four position really in a lot of ways, even though he's kind of more of a three, but um, the one thing I think we need to remember about Scott May is that he didn't, you know, he was eligible to play his freshman year. Well, I could say he, he could have played his freshman year, but he was ineligible. The first year that he came in with with Buckner was the first year that freshmen were allowed to play. And I think in a lot of ways that year in which he had to work on things academically allowed him to to maybe work on skills behind the scenes. I know that everybody would argue that, well, he would have had more – experience in the games, but I think a lot of ways, you know, learning the system behind the scenes, learning what Knight wanted him to do behind the scenes may have contributed to a little bit uh, of what he was able to do tonight. But I think ultimately um, he's just so clutch. He's so clutch and he's the guy and, and I'm, you know, mirroring what Ryan said, you know, you could, you could see what not having a guy like May last year in the lineup against that Kentucky team, his scoring ability did versus, a guy like Bobby Wilkerson tonight. I mean, uh, but May was the guy that that was going to control the game, even though Buckner was kind of your captain running everything from the top. May's ability to score was going to really set the stage for how the game was going to go. And, and early on, things were falling. And when they weren't, he wasn't, you know, he's a senior, he's a veteran, he knows how to play the game. And, um, you know, it, it was just one of those things where it went – Time after time, when he when IU needed a bucket, he was able to contribute that bucket when Michigan kept clawing back. And really when Michigan was up, you know, they had to go down low to May or had to go to Benson to get something uh, to fall, and, and, and that's what he did. Here's another a meaningful moment. I'll throw it to you guys for, for, for yours if you have some. You know, we're going to talk about Benson and, and his points and his dominance offensively, but he had a couple block shots that were really big, and one – uh, in the second half, it was a three or four point lead or something, and, and it blocked, and it went right to Wisman, which led to an offensive possession. I think Indiana scored and might have moved that up to to six points. Uh, we always get in, enamored with uh, the points going up, but I thought Benson was great blocking shots, and I thought his rebounding was really good to start the second half when Indiana had trailed by six and started a run. It looked like he was really being aggressive both on the offensive boards and the defensive boards for the Indiana Hoosiers. Um, Benson defensively, and if you want to go ahead and talk offensively, uh, throw it out, Ryan. Um, yeah, I look, Benson was great defensively, and, and as you mentioned, on the glass, particularly early in the second half, and I think that they really established their dominance down low. It, they reestablished it after a first half. I mean, it's it's easy to forget. They were, lose, they were losing by six at halftime, and it only scored 29 points. They wound up scoring 86, uh, you know, so they really had a run going in the second half. And, and, you know, the other thing that he did, he drew five fouls on Phil Hubbard, who is a phenomenal freshman, having a great year. And once Hubbard was out, you want my meaningful moment? You might have missed. Yeah, it was go Hubbard going to the bench. That yep. that's what it was, and it, that that ended the game. And even the broadcast, they were only up by about six when that happened. But the broadcasters were saying Indiana's starting to celebrate. There's like eight. There's like seven or eight minutes left in the game. At least, but they just knew that. 
Yeah, they knew that they couldn't come back without that guy. You know, he's such a key to their team. And then there was nobody left to contain Benson and May or even, you know, give the appearance of containing them or have an answer for them on the other end. So that was huge. And and Benson and May worked together on that to get him out. And, you know, Benson's just a guy. He's just such a smooth operator on the interior. And and that's how you beat the team up. You just go at them on the interior. And even when you're when you have him well guarded, he can he can bust out that hook shot and make it. He can miss one and then follow it with a rebound. I mean, it's so demoralizing to a team when you play good defense and still get beat that there's nothing more demoralizing in basketball. As you know, coach, you play a great defensive possession and you just, there's nothing you can do and you just have to tip your cap to the other guy. That's hard. And it's hard to keep coming back from that. And, and, you know, Benson had 25, nine rebounds, two assists, a steal, a block. He was, you know, he only three or five from the free throw line, but he was 11 and 20 from the field. He was over 50%. Um, He missed a lot early. There were a lot of early first half misses and I'm sure that was jitters for everybody and just nerves and adrenaline and everything. But it turned out that, you know, he really was the most consistent scorer throughout. I thought May was a little streaky at times where he'd reel off about eight points in a row, where I thought Benson was really consistent throughout the game. Just get get him the ball, let him go to work. And, you know, that's a guy who's a first-team All-American. You expect that from him, but it was good to see it as well. And, um, and again, just a consistent performer. And there's nothing flashy about that guy. He just goes to work. Yeah, and, he put the and, game away with his offense when they hit him. Really, two or three possessions in a row, and then boom, it was it was done. Chris, do you have a meaningful moment uh, that you think someone might have missed? I, I mean, I don't think it's anything specific. I just think the fact that you know they came out in the second half and they were careful with the ball. They didn't commit the turnovers that had plagued them in the first half. They, you know, the one, the other thing to think about is how many bunnies and kind of piggybacking on what Ryan said, Benson missed so many in that first half, but they missed so many toward the end of that first half that could have chipped away at that. that that's deficit. how Michigan took the lead. I mean, that's exactly. There was, the there was like two plays where they had missed three around the rim uh, on consecutive possessions. But I think that coming out of that first half, establishing themselves, they went on a seven Oh run. They went on an eight Oh run. That was the key because they didn't pull away until later, especially when the foul trouble uh, had hit, uh, two of Michigan's starters, but I think that that first five minutes of the second half to kind of reestablish, you know, the, their ability to control the game, to control the tempo the way they wanted to. You didn't see nearly as many fast breaks in the second half that Michigan took advantage of in the first half. So I think to me that's the big thing is just the way they started that second half. Two things: um, one, we'll have no idea of what went went on at halftime with Coach Knight. They, he had a veteran team that had won sixty, ends up winning sixty three of sixty four games in a row. That did not play very well in the, on the on the biggest stage. Had their teammate knocked out and had to make adjustments without anything but a few timeouts. I imagine whether it was yelling or just talking or whatever. I think I would imagine Coach Knight had a lot to do with settling that team down and getting them to play the way they they had. So that's a meaningful moment that we all missed because no one was in there and I'd lo- I would love to to find out um, but that that's when coaches need to step up when something crazy like that happens and another thing is how Indiana managed to play with guys with three fouls and four fouls without losing anyone like Michigan lost key players down the stretch and then the last five or six minutes it, it was over so that that was something that was really important that's veteran players knowing how to play with fouls but it's time now to go inside the numbers uh, and, and I have a couple here, uh, someone we've kind of talked a little bit about, but uh, Quinn Buckner, for me, six of nine from the free throw coming into the game, he was um, 48%. Uh, and I think in the second half, he was six of eight. And, and sometimes, you know, 48% is not very good, but but he was the leader of that team. And, and he meant a lot more to that team than scoring, obviously, and yep. shooting free throws. Uh, but you don't want your point guard to be 48. When I looked at that number, I was like, come on, Quinn, you got to have a good night tonight. Um, and he did. But a lot of times, it's what you do in the clutch situations, in the big games, in the late games. And I imagine that Quinn, uh, but that number I thought was, was important. Um, Ryan, uh, any numbers stand out to you? Yeah, 57 points in the second half versus 29 in the first half. Michigan scored 35 in the first and 33 in the second. Indiana outscored them by 24 points in the second half. That's your stat of the game right there. Indiana came out ready to go, ready to attack, and ready to win in the second half. Michigan did pretty much what they did in the first half and 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 lost. And it was that was again a team that was focused, a veteran team 
a team that, you know, knew their faults. And you were talking about, you know, in your last meaningful moment that what coach Knight did at halftime, I bet he didn't have to yell because the team that knew itself, this is a team that had a lot of veterans, a lot of key veterans, anything he was going to tell them, they already knew. And, and this was a team that I, I just think that had the leadership. They knew what they needed to do in the second half and they went and did it. And, Ryan, and did you see how he coached on the sidelines? And we all have seen the night screaming and yelling. He was just calmly, he'd call Wisman over when he'd get beat on a back cut, calmly talk to Wisman, calmly talk to Scott May. Uh, he was very, very calm. And, and I think your point about when you have a team with, with leaders and experience, you have to coach a little bit less. The, the, yeah. the, the rah rah. Let them coach themselves. Let them coach let themselves them and take care of themselves. Yeah. Stay out of the way. And I think. Coach Knight did a, a really good job with that. But 57 points in, this, in the second half was obviously a huge, huge part of tonight's victory. Chris, uh, numbers that stick out uh, in your mind? Yeah, 39. If you look at May, Benson, and Buckner, they also all played 39 minutes. I think, um, you know, May and Buckner, uh, being the seniors that they are, that's expected. Um, but I think it's, you know, a guy like Benson, a big man, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, you're, you're the, you're the guy down low. You're, you're the one that has to take control of the game against an undersized Michigan game, Michigan team. I think the fact that Benson playing all those minutes stay out of foul trouble with only three is, it was, was key, but those three guys playing those, all those minutes, uh, you can also look at Abernathy, Tom Abernathy, the other senior playing 35 minutes. I mean, it's interesting to see where the subbing was from both teams, but especially with Indiana, uh, the, the dynamics, you know, of those of those three guys with Benson, May, and Buckner, they didn't they didn't leave until the end of the game. So that that says a lot about um, their importance and how much they played in this in this win. Four four players over thirty five minutes is, is uh, totally nineteen seventy six. If we're going to stay in, try to stay in the the era, but. That, that's just unheard of. And if it wasn't, you know, I, I would be interested in going back and seeing other minute distribution from future games, the games in the past, uh, did Wilkerson, if he doesn't get hurt, does he play 35 minutes? Uh, and what, look and at what, Michigan's five, they're starting five, absolutely. all played 30 minutes, 30 yeah, minutes and, and more. Hubbard and Britt probably would have played more, but they fouled out. They both hit 31. They probably would have played, you know, 35, 36. And if I remember right, I, I think I heard the announcer saying that Michigan subbed for the first time. And it was like under four minutes to go yep. uh, in, in the first in the half. First I, half. I, I wrote that down yeah. and um, you know, that that's just, um, that's good conditioning. Uh, that's, that's, you know, good. Uh, I don't know. Strategy, I guess sometimes I always believe you got to play your dudes. Toughness. It's toughness, toughness but man. you, you got to play your dudes. And I think sometimes modern coaches get into this roles and minutes and wanting to, you know, 29, 28 minutes playing efficiently or future coaches will get into this rut. Um, but uh, that was very interesting to see that the best players um, played uh, a lot. Any other uh, stats that you guys want to talk about before we head into the our fourth or third segment? Well, Indiana shot over 60% in the second half after shooting. Uh, in the, I think they were in the 40s. And I don't remember the, the percentage of the first half, but shot over 60% in percent the second half. And I think that was, again, key. It wasn't that they were just shooting great. It was the shots they were getting. They were getting shots really close to the basket easily and, and you know, were, I, again, just beating Michigan into submission with their positioning, with their toughness, with, you know, the way they were getting position on the inside. It just was, they made it look easy. To score. Yeah, the, the shooting percentages flip-flopped in the first half, and I wrote them down, I think, with six minutes left to go in the second half when it was an, on the announcer. But Indiana only shot 45% in the first half to Michigan's uh, 61, and then at one point in the second half it was 61 IU, 35 Michigan. And I think that's, like you said, better offensive shot selection. Sorry, Devontae, um, we're talking about shot selection. But I also think it's that ball pressure, that d that defense that, that took Michigan away from their transition and from what they wanted to do on the half court. Um, anything else statistically, gentlemen? All right. Uh, hey, coming up on the assembly call, we will hand out our game balls, talk about what aged the best and worst from this game, and then try to put it into proper historical context. That's all next here on the assembly call. Stick with us.
This is Tim Priller, and I never miss an episode of The Assembly Call. You're listening to The Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. Catch us live immediately following every IU basketball game or rewatch of Champions, which we have five and other schools in the state don't have. Plus, every Thursday night, Assembly Call Radio. Uh, check out our website, assemblycall.com. And while you're there, make sure you sign up for the free IU Hoops email newsletter. Over 7,000 of your fellow IU fans have subscribed. You can also text IU to 66866 to subscribe to the newsletter. That's IU to 66866. I'm the coach, Brian Tonsoni, here with Ryan Phillips and Chris Williams, and we are talking about Indiana's national championship victory in our rewatch tonight over Michigan. It's now time for uh, our game balls, and uh, we'll start with you, Ryan. Who are you giving your game ball to? Who, who was this Ryan. One? Me, okay. Uh, I'm giving it to Camp Benson. Sorry, you you stuttered for me. Uh, I'm giving it to Camp Benson. I thought he was the most consistent player all night for Indiana. I thought Scott May. I mean, you could give it to either guy. Honestly, you could give it to either guy. Um, but I I thought that Benson was more consistent with his offense, and I thought that just the work he did down low, uh, getting Phil Hubbard out of the game was so important for what Indiana had to do. Um, I would not argue with with May or even Quinn Buckner for the way he led the team at times. Uh, I, I think both of them would be worthy recipients, uh, but I'm going with Benson because I just thought throughout the game consistently when Indiana needed a basket, he was able to give it to him. And, and I thought the work he did on the interior was, uh, was what helped them was the biggest key to them winning the game. Chris, who are you giving your game ball to? I mean, you have to go with may Scott may, in my opinion, I mean, he's the national player of the year for a reason. Um, he, he can take control of the game very quickly, which he did. Uh, and I, you know, he, he is, Stat line is not overpowering. I mean, you could say, okay, 26 points, ho-hum. But he, he it did so many little things, and he did he the key baskets that he made at, at crucial points when Michigan was clawing back or when they needed to – to to or when Indiana needed to claw back and kind of erase the deficit. I, I just think that uh, this this entire year it's been his team. I, you know, you can argue it's, it's Buckner's team from a commanding standpoint of what he does as the point guard, but – uh, May's scoring ability and and just his timeliness of baskets uh, is why he deserves it to me. I think um, I think it's probably one of the tougher decisions in a single game. If you, I would agree with you, Chris. Over the course of the season, the course of two seasons, uh, for most valuable. But uh, tonight, I'm going to side with Ryan uh, and give the game ball to Kent Benson. Uh, I just me. I just think that. Um, his dominance at the key moments, the start of the second half with his rebounding, offensive rebounding, and then when the the lead got stretched out to 10 or so, the ball went into him two or three times, and he was just too dominant. And fouling out Hubbard, as was mentioned earlier, uh, I think that that was just a uh, a notch above May tonight uh, for the game ball. But that's that's just a very fine difference between those two fine players. And really – you know, uh, in big games like this, we might have to ask Jared to, you know, give, give a list because you got to give credit to those guys off the bench that filled in who probably weren't expecting to play those minutes and Wilkerson goes down. You talk about being ready when, when your time is ready and being prepared. Uh, Radford and um, Wisman and Cruz, Cruz were a big part of, of winning or, or there are no game balls for, for uh, you know, coming in second. And so kudos yeah, I would, uh, to I would those almost, guys. At this point, I would almost advocate for a co-game ball between May and Benson. I mean, I really, yeah. it's splitting, you're splitting the tiniest of hairs and, and both guys fully deserved it, I thought. And and obviously, if you're going for the season or the tournament, it's May, but in this one game, I kind of lean, lean Benson, but who knows? I mean, they both were so good. I think it's, you know, you're really splitting the tiniest of hairs there. So so we're, we're going to talk a little history here before we get into what aged best and what aged worst, but 32 and 0. Uh, undefeated national champion, 63 out of 64, real close to being back-to-back undefeated champions. Um, as an Indiana fan, uh, alums, gentlemen, uh, when you look back, you know, I was only nine, and you guys weren't even born yet probably, but how, how do you feel having that be your university, and what's the significance of that um, just in college basketball and for Indiana basketball going forward? I know that's a lot of questions in there, but let's spend some time talking about how significant this season was um, in the history of basketball. Chris, we'll start with you. 
Oh, you, you have to think about it in a couple of ways. You know, we've Indiana is the last to be an undefeated team and, and go all the way through, but we've also not had any team win that national title with only one loss since Indiana won it. So a couple, just another way to look at it, but you look at what Indiana did back to back. And I, I know that we're, it's, we don't want to always, you know, group in 75 with this conversation, but so much sure. of what happens with 75 contributes to what happens with 76. But you, you know, the 76 team did not breeze through the season like the 75 team. I mean, the 75 team um, beat their opponents in conference play by 23 points, which is still a record. They had six games where they scored over 100 points. Um, they, with they no three-point line. With no three-point line. They just overpowered teams. They had definitely had the better scoring group than the 76 team, but the 76 team had the better defensive team, de- defensive dynamics because Bobby Wilkerson became a starter in 76 when he was a reserve in 75. But I think of it as, you know, what could have happened during that season? I mean, Indiana escapes an overtime against Kentucky. They barely beat, they almost gave away a game at home to Notre Dame. They had two really close games, a one point game, one of them being a one point game against Purdue. They didn't, you know, breeze through the, the Big Ten by any means, but I mean, the back to back eighteen and zero seasons. I mean, it's 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 incredible. It's it's you know, I mean, Indiana and UCLA winning in seventy two and seventy three, the only teams to go back to back in conference play for two years and win the national title. I mean, you're you're talking about circumstances that are very very small in terms of these accomplishments. I mean, and, and to me, you know, we we always think about this. And, and this year was a little bit more – it was a little different. We look at, okay, who's left, who's left, who's undefeated. You know, and this year it kind of – it was ended pretty quickly. But it's one of those things that I still think about. It's one of those things that I still look at. And it's one of those things to me – I'll be selfish, you know, and everybody says records are meant to be broken. I don't want it to be broken, and I don't think it oh. will. It's, it's too difficult. It's too difficult because if you think about what, what is – I mean, look at the 76 season, this, this Final Four. Rutgers was undefeated as well. You had two undefeated teams in the final four in this tournament. And it, 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 just imagine if you had had Rutgers undefeated versus, uh, uh, you know, an Indiana team undefeated. That would have been incredible. And again, this is Rutgers pre big 10, by the way, folks, if you're, if you're, <laughs> yeah, thankfully. But um, I, I just think of it as, you know, it, it, when you think about why Indiana history basketball Indiana basketball history is so important. This is a, this is the, the at the top of the list. I mean, you had the ability to brag about your alma mater being the last team to go undefeated in college basketball history. I mean, that's something that's pretty unique to say. Yeah, I think it's I think what's worth noting here is uh, before this win. I mean, everybody knew Indiana was a basketball state. Uh, you know that that's been that way forever. But Indiana had won two national titles at this point. They won it in 1940 and 1953. It had been a long time since Indiana won a national title. And back then, the tournament was a little different than it was in the modern version of it. And they'd been in contention plenty of times. They'd, you know, gone to Final Four, they'd gone to the Final Four in, in 73. But they won, this was winning a national title again. This gives you, you know, three as a school that elevates you above the two. And especially, you know, like the more you get, you get to another tier. And then, you know, coming down the heels, this is what started the run of Indiana being one of those. Well, it had always been a, you know, a top tier program. This really took it to the blue blood level by winning here and going undefeated. That makes people notice. And then you get the next one and the next one. And that puts you further up the list and, and puts you into rarefied air. And I think that this was sort of that getting over the hump of a program of being like, well, plenty of teams have two national titles, you know, and, and getting a third one really establishes, okay, this is a place where history happens. It separates you from like a San Francisco. Exactly. And then you get another one and that separates you from all the others. And then, it, you know, you get another one. So I really think this was a huge moment for the program. Because it, it it put them over the hump of like Chris said, you know, some of the other teams that have won two national titles because they had a really good player for a couple of years. You know, this this really separated that. Um, so I, I think that it's that's what's important about this. Not only the undefeated season and all of that, but if you're looking at back as as you know an alum, that is really a turning point for Indiana as a basketball school and a basketball program is just taking it to the next level and then continuing to to do that as they would over the next you know, I think it's what the next decade really, but you know, 15 years or so. 
and it's what uh, drives like our show, uh, fellas. And, and I mean, that's with without the, the, this success early in the '70s and night coming and changing uh, the way basketball was looked at with the defensive mindset and motion offense, and and then backing it up with winning and winning convincingly uh, by being undefeated. You, you know, uh, we all long for that. It's it's been a long time. Uh, and people always say you're not a blue blood anymore and all that. But, yeah, we are because this is where that was for those 20 years. And we've had little uh, pieces of it, but we, we yearn to get back to that. But all of what Indiana is today does not happen without this team starting it. And, and there's no – there's you know, no way maybe 81 or 87 happen if, if Knight doesn't come here and have the, the four years, five years start that, that he had. So it's, it's really, uh, I think, a vital part of – uh, Indiana basketball, whether you were around to see it or not, um, it is something. Uh, Chris, I'll, I'll turn to you. What was, was Kentucky the last team to enter the Final Four undefeated? Or and I know UNLV was, but what what teams have challenged I, Indiana's I, or Ryan? I was there when, in in Indianapolis when Kentucky went in undefeated and lost to Wisconsin. I was at okay. that game. Um, that I don't remember what year that was. It was re, I, like fifteen. Fifteen. Maybe, so fifteen. Fifteen sounds right. And and they were really good that year, and they were undefeated. And I was we got we randomly got tickets to the Final Four, and we flew out to Indianapolis to go to. And I was like, oh god, am I going to watch an undefeated Indi- uh, Kentucky team win a national title? Is that is that my first trip to the Final Four? What it's going to be <laughs> is watch Kentucky become the the, the new undefeated. That would have been an all new low if it had been. It, it absolutely would have been because of what was going on with Indiana's program at the time yeah. and all that. And we didn't have to worry about Purdue, obviously. Before but, you know, that, Kentucky would have been. Yeah. Before that, was it UNLV? In, in in 91, was there teams between 91 and Kentucky that made it that far? Did a Gonzaga team or anyone? I don't think, I don't think, I don't think Gonzaga was undefeated going into the Final Four. No, they weren't. Yeah, um, I, it might have been the only UNLV. two that I can remember is UNLV. It might have been UNLV with yeah, Stacey a, Ogman and Larry Johnson. There was a year that St. Joe's made the tournament undefeated, but they, they didn't get past like the Sweet 16 or the Elite Eight or something like right. that. And there was, you know, that <clears throat> Illinois team lost before the tournament, right. I think, the year they lost to North Carolina. and um, But they went a long portion of the season undefeated. Um, but yeah, the one I can remember is UNLV. Yeah. I'm like you guys. I breathe a sigh of relief when everyone ha- has a loss and. Um, I was at the yeah. 91 Final Four, um, and, and there was a great North Carolina-Kansas game before that. Uh, and I talked to Mike DeCourcy today, and he, he didn't see that Duke-UNLV game where UNLV got beat because he was writing about uh, an ejection that Dean Smith had in, in a Final Four game. So there, there's some crazy things to protect the undefeated uh, history of, of the Indiana Hoosiers. It was big for me, fellas. I was nine years old, and my dad was a big Indiana fan. It's just when Channel 4 was uh, pushing that across the state, the, the Martha the Mop Lady stuff. And, and my dad um, was a coach of all kinds, made his name as a swim coach, but a coach basketball and football. He really liked this new guy, Coach Knight. And, and I remember as a youngster sitting down and watching you know, Martha come on and and get all fired up, and and I, I even kept a scrapbook of of the box scores, and I wish I still had that. Uh, but that's when I fell in love with Quinn Buckner because my dad always said that Quinn Buckner runs the show. He runs the show. You know, he he gets him in the right spot. He guards people, and that's why to this day Quinn Buckner is is my favorite uh, IU player, even though he didn't score all the points and and isn't as flashy as number one picks and all of those things. But it it holds a a, a place, you know. I don't remember a whole lot from that night. I do remember them them winning, and I do remember the final dance. That's why I brought it up in in the banner moment. I do remember that and seeing my dad say, "That's why you know Coach Knight's going to be uh, a, a good coach." And that's where my dad Indiana just became the place for me from from that point on. So so this game tonight holds special meaning to me in my Indiana fandom. My dad was at IU the four years from 72 to 76. And he, um, good four years to be there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, he had a good friend who was, who worked in the ticket office. And for the 76 season, he sat in the second row of the, of the bleachers two nights in the team's left for the whole season. And he remembered, you know, just, he, he, he remembered 75 and he remembered going into 76, knowing that this was going to be something tremendous and to be a part of. And, you know, the famous story is, is, on a senior night when, when Knight acknowledges the seniors, the four seniors, and, and he tells the crowd, you know, take a look at this because you're not going to see a team like this again in the future. You are uh, 
listening here to the Assembly Call Post Game Show. A little bit of uh, upcoming uh, information. Thursday we have AC Radio, and uh, Saturday it'll be IU versus North Carolina in the 1981 championship rewatch. And then next Monday, a week from tonight, IU versus Syracuse in the 1987 uh, rewatch and post game show. So put it on your calendar um, to uh, to watch those. And remember that uh, you're because you're an Assembly Call listener, you get 20% off your entire order at homefieldapparel.com with the promo code ASSEMBLY. Two zero. So if you want a great deal on the most comfortable and unique IU apparel that you'll find anywhere, uh, go to homefieldapparel.com and use the promo code assembly20 for 20% off your entire order. And guys, let's talk a little bit about what's aged well and what has not aged well. And and there's a lot of things on my list, but I'm going to turn it loose. Ryan, go ahead. You got first shot. Well, the first is, is God, I, I like watching that game. It was almost like watching a ra- I texted you coach. It was almost like watching a radio broadcast. I mean, half the time I couldn't tell who was who and who had the ball. And, and what happened uh, to the, the, the NCAA had like an HD re re uh, um, re-recorded version that was on YouTube oh, a couple years ago it. and it disappeared. Oh, it did. Cause I yes. looked for a different version before tonight. Cause I was like, ah, oh, this is bad. Yeah, I kept like, I hearing could, down like oh, who number is that? Yeah. I get, you know, cause guys would get the ball and, and they'd be like, wait, no, that's not Scott May. And you know, b- b- broadcasters mess up anyway in the heat of a game. So at one point they said Scott May had scored and it was Buckner. And you know, it was, there was just, you know, a bunch of stuff like that. So whoever invented HD, God bless you. Thank you so much. Because <laughs> in the future, in like 40 years in the future, when people are rewatching games from now, they're going to actually be able to understand what's going on in the game. Um, but I also think uh, one of the things that was interesting and it didn't age well was the lack of a three point line without the three point line. The spacing was awful. I mean, there, there was just, it basically everybody was bunched inside seven feet or 10 feet and just bunched in there. And, it, you know, somebody would pop out via several screens or whatever. And it wasn't a lot of freedom of movement. It, it wasn't really flowing basketball. Only time you got flowing basketball was on a breakaway, really. And occasionally a guy would slip or something. You'd get a wide open lane to the basket. But for the most part, it was very bogged down basketball. And it was, you know, a lot of guys, well, there's very physical. And I was fine with that. And I thought the officials for the most part, let the physical play where two guys were going after ball and bumped into each other go. It was really more the, if you fouled somebody, you know, and impeded their progress, they might've called a foul. Um, but I thought it was really, it was interesting to see the dichotomy without that three point line and giving guys a spot to stand on the perimeter and, and maybe a, a natural spacing what happened. And it was just everybody bogged down in that key. Uh, and, you'll and see so, that you'll again see- in the 81 game. And yeah. I think also, Ryan, if we really look at it, when the three-point shot come in in 87, you'll still see some crowded lanes yes. in that NCAA game in 87. And I don't think until coaches started standing people out there and putting three or four people out around there, two or three Probably years the, after the three-point line, did the spacing become a lot of what we see today. It took a long yeah, like time for that to Yeah, like 91 to 94. Old. Yeah. 91 to 94, that's when you started seeing guys, you know, three guys beyond that line to open up things in the middle and stuff like it's that. It's almost yeah. unwatchable, though. As much as I love watching old games like this, it's like, how do you even move? Scott May tried to make a, a basket scrum. cut from the elbow, and and Benson was like two feet outside the lane. Like there's not even room there to make yeah. that basket cut, but that's no. What you it was did it was like days. watching it was like watching old football where they just hand it to the running back and gain three yards every play. You know the three yards of a cloud of dust. That's what it felt like. You know it was just kind of like run of the line. Okay, let's do it again. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. It wasn't beautiful basketball, um, but for what it was, it was interesting to watch the strategy. Is that you have to game plan as a coach that everybody's going to be packed in there. How are you going to get your guy the ball? And, and so there's a lot of cross screening and a lot of, yeah. you know, high, low screening and things like that. But it was pretty much just one guy on the perimeter and one guy might pop out to receive a pass. But it was pretty much one guy on the perimeter the whole time and everybody else is real low and, and just kind of. And then when scrum. Wisman takes a shot, that. that would be a wide open, normal, expected shot. Maybe even after a fast break in today's game, Wisman takes it. And I'm already in the mode at 76. I'm like, Wisman, that's not the shot we want. And it's not the shot you want. It's not the no. shot one. And it's like an 18, it's an 18 foot jump yeah. shot. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> 
from a guard. What about Chris, you, Chris? What didn't age well for you? You're the historian here. What did, what didn't age well, or what didn't, didn't age well? Well, Steve Steve Grody's perm was dry, the hair. You know, I loved it. I don't know nuts. what you're. Ta- hey, you know what? In Starsky a couple weeks, and Hutch was with, that the seventies? <laughs> in a, in a couple weeks, we're all locked down. That's what everyone's going to start looking like. <laughs> you, you know, me being the the historian and the collector, uh, the one thing I, I appreciated the age very well was the uniforms and the warmups that has not changed sure. at all. And that was Knight's touch because when Knight came in the second season, they, they got away from the cream and crimson and went red and white for, you know, forever. Um, and you could, you could see how he, he made his mark because it's, it's, I mean, the uniforms have changed slightly, but the, the candy stripes are still there. The, the, the red jackets with the script Indiana on the back and the interlocked on the front that has not changed. And that remains timeless uh, to this day. And it's something that, I, that uh, we as Indiana fans appreciate that that has not been really altered too much. And so that was the big takeaway for me. What, what do you guys think about the two man crew officiating and how demonstrative they are in making their calls? Not only do they throw their hand up real hard, but they sprint uh, you don't see Bo Borowski doing that. Uh, they they were these they, days, and it huh? also took forever. Like they kept going. They were like explaining to the players, and then they would make the the decision. And that that was like the overly dramatic uh, mode. Yeah, I don't. They could never get away with two today, obviously. But yeah, yeah that was just, just too much going on. Yeah, you know, and too fast. I mean, you'd see those offensive possessions. They the offensive possessions could last over a minute back then, and yeah. you would just you know with with you know, two guys, that's easier because you get your positions, you're there, you're watching the whole thing, you're settled. You don't have to run up and down the floor constantly. And and uh, there was a lot of running in this game specifically, but, you know, that was with an up-tempo team in Michigan. You take out the up-tempo team and it's just a rock fight every night. You don't need a third official for that, I don't think. All right, for you youngins, what do you think about the jump ball? I love no it. alternating possession. Uh, who was, who was it that was it, uh, would he said wooden wanted to get rid of the jump ball or somebody wanted to get rid of the jump ball. I think think it was wooden. I think, I think he said that John wouldn't because you can't regulate the jump well enough. Like guys don't toss it right. And I was thinking, Oh, John, Oh, you're going to hate the future, you know, (laughs) but I I thought it was fun. Especially, you know, that'd be a good rule to add under five minutes. Like I get the alternating possession, but once it gets under five minutes, we're doing an actual jump ball. And I think that you got those. You know, you got those circles on each side of the floor. You might as well use them at some point for a jump ball circle. Uh, that's what they're there for. So, I don't know. I, I, I liked it. I thought it was cool. I have a few more. Anyone else have any you want to throw in there? Oh, keep going, Coach. Keep going. All right. So, for, for the collector, the IU cheerleader sweaters with the horizontal candy stripes um, were a little different. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if those you, aged well or not aged well. Well, that and, and adding on to that same area, the red turtlenecks and the band, that was yeah. horrid. That was uh, awful. $28 <laughs> a ticket for 1977 Final Four. And you had to mail it in. Yeah. <laughs> that was yeah, the they, they put the – you know there was some you – know, you know Velma from like Heltonville was sitting there at her, at her TV trying to write down the address, and it was Before. up there for like eight seconds. Okay, and that was it, you know. And she doesn't have a DVR to stop it and go no. back. And I love that you, it. you yeah. literally mailed your, your money and like your name and address and everything just to a ticket office at next year's Final Four and just hoped – and prayed that you got it back. You got think, back. think about the, 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 you know, they talk about the crowd, 17,000 in the spectrum. Yeah. You know, that's the one thing that it did not age well because the NCAA clearly saw the motivation of packing the football stadiums for a, a horrible viewing party of an NCAA tournament, unless you're in, in an optimal viewing area. But that, that clearly is something that they'll never go back to because it's, it's too, it's too lucrative. And obviously it'll be interesting to see, what the ultimate uh, loss is for this year in terms of mm-hmm. a ticket. Have you guys ever been to the spectrum? Had any chance? No, I've never it's been down now. I believe um, back in 2005, 2006, there's a first round NCA in Philadelphia. I went with uh, some family members and it was still up and I got to, to walk in and, and just walk up one of the entryways. And that was pretty cool to, to know that, uh, you know, in 76 and then in 81, the, the, the two champions um, were there. Um, and then Kurt Gowdy, uh, probably again, I'm aging myself cause you guys might not be as found as 
fond of Kurt Gowdy, but I grew up on, with Kurt Gowdy announcing just about everything. Uh, and it was good to hear him again because you do remember the announcers when you first start following sports. Uh, some of them you like, some of you don't like. But Kurt Gowdy, to me, when you hear his voice, it just brings me to real big time athletic events. And so, but there was some comments. Enberg was on the sideline. Yeah, how about a young Dick Enberg? Yeah. I mean, and, and but, I a man, a man with a degree from IU. Yeah, so, so that that, that I thought was good. Uh, and then there were a couple comments that I think were just funny. I'm not sure you hear today. Uh, streaked off 17 points in a row um, was one comment. These modern players are really being able to get off the floor. Modern players followed by a jump ball in the next possession. And the one that really got me was Gowdy after Kent Benson took a hook shot. He quote says, quote, that hooker is a tough is tough to cover. Uh and I, I, I that might be on a five second rule now on uh yeah, I, uh, on, yeah. on on the NCA. <laughs> so I thought there were some some comments that maybe didn't age as well as as they, they should have been. Um so uh I think that covers everything that I had uh, written down. Anything else that aged well or or did not? Fellas? No, I think I think I think that line can kind of end this, Coach. I think you I think you I think you capped it off pretty well. I think we're down to final thoughts now. All right, we're gonna get to final thoughts. I'm supposed to. I read that ad read a little bit too early, but hey, just go to home field. I think we all. I got the Bison on tonight, Ryan. Do you have the Me Bison? Me too. Um, man, those those guys are really good. And and again, go to your local businesses and take care of each other. Uh, you know, we enjoy bringing this content to you. It, it is a way to get away from the <clears throat> awful things that are going on. Uh, so support each other, support local people, uh, support home fields, support your uh, food pantries uh, if you can. Uh, and if anyone needs any anything, you know, re- reach out to people. So, so there's an impromptu ad read before we go into uh, last call. Chris, uh, your last call on Indiana's championship tonight over Michigan. You know, I, it's looking back and just kind of thinking about, you know, what this meant for the for the program and, and how things really changed so quickly. You know, we were talking before we recorded about, you know, the period between this championship and the 81 championship. Uh, just in, in the decade of the 70s after this, you had 11 players that left the IU program from this team, which was Bob Bender, and then the next season – Valvish just left, but just how much this, you know, how much this team uh, in terms of its dynamics and in terms of its personnel was just so prototypically a night team. And it, it was just to come, how many players were just not going to be willing to, to fit into that kind of system and, and how we, I think we take for granted sometimes just, you know, what this team is historically. And I, obviously we don't to some extent because it's 32 and 0, but I think to me, it's important that the younger generations know about this team. I think we're getting so we're getting farther and farther away from this team and and this era. And I, you know, we talk about it. I'm not going to, you know, beat a dead horse, but we talk about how the generation now at IU and in the last couple of years just haven't been able to see a lot of really good basketball consistently. Um, You know, the people who were there in 76 or 81, 87 or early 90s, um, or even when I was there in 2002, we were lucky to see that. And I, I just think that, you know, hopefully we're, we're, you know, we see it all the time, but we don't forget about th- this team. We don't forget about the, the high p- points in, in IU history and, and we get back there sooner than later. Ryan, your last call. I mean, it was fun getting to watch the last game from the greatest IU team probably of all time. I mean, there's arguments you can make for, for other teams, certainly, but, but, you know, this is the team that finished off a season undefeated. You can't argue with that part of it. They beat everybody in front of them. And uh, it's so rare you see that in sports, let alone college basketball. And so seeing two all-time greats, three really all-time greats in, in Buckner and, and May and Benson getting to play together and, and finish off their great run, really a great two-year run. Um, I know that, uh, Benson stuck around for another year after that, but the, just seeing those guys finish off that really those two seasons while they were different is really one journey because their whole goal was to win that title. And it took them two seasons to get there because of what happened in, uh, in 75. So really just an, you know, a, a wonderful thing to watch back. I've never seen that game before. 
So that was really big for me to get to, to get to watch it finally. Obviously, know the story of that team and the story of the year before and all that, but I'd never watched the, the full game. I'd seen highlights, never seen the full game. So it was really great to watch that. And I look forward to the last two. Um, they're games that I've seen, but it's always going to be fun to rewatch you know, IU hoisting a championship. So again, a really important moment for IU uh, in, in 76 to win that. Knight's first title elevated you above other programs and also to, to finish an undefeated season that hasn't been matched since. So really uh, just a, just a, a really fun rewatch and, and thanks to both you guys for being on here with it. I'd like to thank everyone for watching. Uh, thank you, Chris and Ryan for being here. This is an important game watch um, for a lot of people to, to keep uh, uh, understanding what Indiana basketball is and, and what it needs to be again. And also understanding how, uh, teams fit together you will see in the 81 championship to 87 the the years that got really close with the Cheney years and the games that we've watched good team chemistry good role understanding and execution from their players uh, a coach that gets that done and yes everything's not always perfect with uh the next two seasons or or transfers but Indiana basketball is very special when done the right way and players accept their roles and execute their roles correctly and we saw that tonight uh, as Wilkerson went down people stood uh, you know stood up and, and took on the challenge and helped Indiana win their third national champion the first in the Bob Knight era and we will see you next weekend uh, when we watch the 1981 championship and the 87 championship until then please stay safe do what you can uh, to help you and, and others around you. And again, if you have any extra money, donate to those who, who are in need. And even if it's not monetary, reach out to people with a note, say something positive. Uh, a lot of things, um, there's some mental stress in that that is going to be going on with, with a lot of different people. I know Chris and I see it a lot in the education world. Um, we'll get this uh, taken care of. We're all in this together, and there will be a time when we're all back together Um fist pumping and and screaming for our Hoosiers in person. Until then, uh, I'm Coach Tonsoni. Have a great uh, evening. We'll see you soon.